Hello, and this is just a quick heads up to my subscribers who may have seen this video before because this is actually a re-upload. Now unfortunately I've received a copyright claim against some of the clips that I've put into my video. Now the claim hasn't come from the people who made those clips, it's actually come from the company that provided the music for those clips. Anyway, this is a re-edit and a re-upload. Hello and welcome to another episode of Project Supercar. In this episode we'll continue to look at the chassis and I think we should discuss one problem with many chassis and that's rust. stop any shaky cam. I'm going to give it a try. Um, it should also come in handy when I'm at the uh, Stonely kit car show in May. So let's take a trip down to the workshop. Let's take a trip down to the workshop. Oh, it's a bit weird getting used to this uh, gimbal. Whoop. Here we go. Yeah. Woo. Line up with the door. Press this button. There's the door handle. I've got the clam all the way up at the moment. That's like the service position. Whoa. This is a bit weird. Let's have a quick look on the interior. Yeah, oh, yeah, straighten up. Let's have a look around. There's the sign on the wall. And turn around. There's the clam all the way up. Engine bay. Let's do the car. Well, it looks like I need a little bit more practice with that gimbal. That'll be fun. Anyway, let's get back to the chassis and rust. Before the days of carbon fibre and aluminium, just about all chassis on cars were made from steel. And supercars and my car is no different. Now, as many of you know, the problem with using steel is obviously rust. And if you're building a car, it's in all weathers, salt on the roads, it can be a problem. So when I was designing my car, I wanted to be absolutely sure I was going to protect the chassis as much as possible. I mean, after all, I live in the UK and it rains 385 days of the year. Anyway, if you're into cars, then I'm sure you know a load of rust buckets out there. They're fun cars, got plenty of character, loads of performance, but they're rust buckets. I mean, feel free to drop a few comments if you know of any. Now one such brand that I really enjoy and I've actually owned is TVR. I love the cars, I love the sound, I love the power, I love the looks, everything about them, but yes, the chassis do rust. And unfortunately, this is down to a badly designed car. A lot of the chassis was exposed under the bodywork and around the wheel arches. So once the powder coating had been stripped, we had bare steel, and then the outriggers would just rust. The trouble on the TVR, what you've got to look for is, is potential rust on the chassis. Uh, the chassis on these, they're actually painted white, you can sort of see just the wishbone going off in there. But the critical area on a TVR is here. You can see it, oh dear, in there there's that tube there, and then you can just see it in the bottom of the wheel arch. And then that tube then runs all the way along the sills and it's completely unprotected. Look at the rear, it is just popping up again and going up to the back. Um, completely unprotected. Um, and that's the bit you've really got to check when you're looking at a TVR. So if this went unchecked, it would result in a chassis that would need extensive repair. And on a TVR, that pretty much means pulling the bodywork off. This isn't something I would suggest a DIYer to do, 
um, I would suggest that you go to a professional, and that's not cheap. So if you had a TVR with a rotten chassis, rotten outriggers, and you have to pay someone to repair it, well, unfortunately, that almost writes the car off in some, some cases. Um, you end up having to replace the entire chassis sometimes. Ryan Little. <laughs> So the bodywork would actually protect the chassis. So none of the chassis, almost virtually none of the chassis, was exposed to the elements. Once I'd finished the rear part of the chassis, I could then work on the side part here. So the chassis runs along this part of the car, and there's two main beams, one just underneath here, and obviously one at the bottom of the chassis. Now I wanted to make sure that these were protected. So the underside of the chassis has aluminium panelling, but we'll get to that in another episode. So these parts of the car are separate to the top part and they can be removed. The idea is to have them bonded on a little bit like um, a Lotus Avora. Now, although I was actually designing this part of the chassis, when you're designing the whole car, you have to consider the driving position, the dash and everything like this. So I used the original bulkhead from the original donor car as mock-up. Um, just to give you some uh, measurements and that. We'll go into that in another episode, but for now, let's just concentrate on the side of the car. Actually, I think it might be a good idea if I remove this and then brought the camera in so you could have a closer look. Um, I'm on my own and I really could do with someone holding this door up, but I'll give it a go. We'll see if we can pull this off and then that will expose the chassis and then we can take a closer look. And we'll probably take a look at the fuel tank as well. I think we'll start by removing this panel on the top of the Nissan. Some of you might have noticed this piece in there, in the bodywork. Well that is so I can get to that. Another reason I had to put this notch into the bodywork is so you can get the fuel tank out. Now those of you who know anything about the Lotus Air Spray will know that to get the fuel tanks out you've got to take the engine out. Now I didn't want to do that with my car, so to get this out, needed a notch. That's the fuel sender, and on the other side of the car is the filler. And inside this nacelle, you can also put some electrics and other things, so it's out of the way of the engine bay, and also it shouldn't get wet and corrode. But that's the reason for the notch in the bodywork. Right, this panel here is removable and this is designed to house the intercooler and some ducting to cool the engine and also to cool the rear brakes. So we'll pull this off now. Let's take a quick look in the footwell. Hopefully you should be able to see this. Hopefully you can make out that the chassis is actually inside the bodywork of the car. It's also a good place to put quite a lot of the electrics. And there's still plenty of foot space, loads. 
but because the chassis is inside the car, it shouldn't rust. Now, that's not easy with just one person. So I hope you appreciate what I'm doing just to show you under the skin. Whew. Oh. So there we go, the side's off. So, I think you can see the chassis rails. One there, one there, and there's the uh, aluminium floor that I've, this is a uh, pot riveted and also glued and sealed, so uh, that really shouldn't rust. I think this also shows the modular design that I'm going for. So all these body panels are separate. So the side can come off and you can put on a different one, different design, different styling. So all the body panels are separate. And I've mentioned before, this is a lot more work to do than just a one piece body. But anyway, the fuel tank's also on display. So we might as well just touch on that quickly. Now on my car, I have twin fuel tanks, one either side. Now there's a whole load of uh, rules and laws and regulations regarding fuel tanks and racing and I can't really go into all that right now. That's probably a video all on its own. This fuel tank meets the requirements of the IVA test here in the UK. Unfortunately, they changed the rules and this cap, which was regulation, now has to be tethered. So I'm going to have to redesign these fuel tanks. Thank you very much bureaucrats. Now this is now not allowed in the UK. So when I was designing this tank, I made some cardboard mock-ups first, just for proof of concept and make sure that it fitted into the chassis. It's strapped in in one place with this uh, stainless steel strap and there's foam all the way around it so it doesn't rub against the chassis and leak. It's joined to the other tank on the other side through a tube, uh, it's about, I think it's about uh, 60 millimeters in diameter. I wanted to put a very large diameter pipe in between both tanks so that the second tank would fill up quickly. So you're not there clicking away, you know, this tank fills up, all clicks, and then you've got to wait for it to drain across. I didn't want that. So I've got a very large hose in between the two tanks, so that isn't a problem. So here's the pipe that runs from one fuel tank to the other. Hopefully you can just about see that. Ignore all the dust, I'm gonna to have to clean this out. Um, but this is the prototype, okay? So I think I'm gonna do a redesign. In fact, I have done a redesign. And I'm gonna use a slightly smaller pipe, which will be about 54 millimeters. And it will actually come from underneath the fuel tank, and then it will run through the chassis. There'll be some uh, metal tubes welded into the chassis, and then the fuel pipe will run through the chassis. But uh, that will be on the turbo chassis. Anyway, here's a quick video on how a fuel tank is made. So the next thing we need to decide is what material we're going to make this tank out of. With the ethanol in fuel nowadays, aluminum is not necessarily the best choice. However, it is easier to work with than the better alternative that is stainless steel. Bending, grinding, sanding, cutting, pretty much every step of the process is more difficult with stainless steel than it is with aluminum. Stainless steel also requires you back purge your weld. So if you're doing a full tank, well, you're gonna have to back purge the entire tank. That is a lot of argon you're gonna be putting into the tank. So that's a much increased expense on the overall project. With those factors in mind, I'm choosing to work with aluminum. And quite honestly, aluminum will still hold up just fine. Stainless would just hold up better. That's all there is to it. 
Now, the material that I chose to work with is 3003 aluminum in a 80,000th thickness, that is 0 0.080 of an inch. The reason for the 3003 is it's soft, so it's easy to form, and it's also weldable. So, first and foremost, since this will be a street-driven vehicle, I want to put baffles in here to prevent fuel from sloshing side to side as you're driving down the street, taking a corner, or accelerating and decelerating. I've got the hole you saw me cut in there, I've got the hole for the fuel level sender in, and I've got the hole as well as the actual fitting for the vent already in. I've got the main structure tacked together, and I've got the baffles welded in. This is the original Audi wiring loom. One of the reasons I put these large to say boxes at the back of the car is obviously to hide and protect the fuel tank and also to put all the extra wiring and ECUs and fuses and that sort of thing. Get it out of the engine bay, put it somewhere nice and safe and dry so it doesn't get wet and all that sort of stuff. Here's a quick look at the side panels. Obviously this is the plug. All this wooden frame is just part of the plug, okay? This will be fiberglass. This isn't the final piece or anything. And no, I'm not making a supercar out of wood. So this will be fiberglass. Now, if you like this channel, smash that like button. Make sure you subscribe. And also make sure you comment down below. Yay! Oh, I can't believe I just did that. Well, okay, I don't want to do all that. I don't want to be asking you to subscribe and I don't want to be asking you to comment and click likes. But I do have a problem. Um, ever since I started this channel, obviously my subscribers have been going up slowly, but it's been going up very slowly. The YouTube algorithms are not kind to my channel. Now, I want to get to the fun stuff. That's the fiberglassy. I want to make the moulds make the finished car, I also want to get, I want to get on to the uh, turbo chassis. Now, unfortunately, all this is going to cost money. I have to buy the fiberglass, I've got to buy the steel. I'll probably have to employ a couple of people because making moulds on my own is just too much. I'm going to need at least another person to help with the large moulds. This is going to cost some money. So, if you want to help me out, just watch my videos and spread the word. As soon as my numbers get up there and this channel starts making some money, I can put all of it, 100% of the money, into finishing this, okay? I don't need to make a living off it, not at the moment, okay? This is just a hobby and I've put enough of my own money into it at the moment. All I need is some help from you lot, so if you could just watch my videos, click like, I know it's a cliche, but it's gonna help me. So if you could do that, much appreciated. So, if you like what you see, I'm doing a bit of a Tavarish. If you like what you see, anyway, if you like what you see, then catch me on the next one. Bye for now.